Hello, my name is Sheila and I would like to welcome you to my podcast All About You. I love to listen to podcasts and especially conversations with famous people. However, I think everyone has a story to tell. Maybe a place you have visited, a hobby you enjoy or anything that you feel would be of interest. I want to have conversations with lots of different people and hear their stories. So if you have a story to tell, please contact me on my email allaboutyoupodcast at yahoo.com. Welcome to the All About You podcast and my guest today is Ben who's an actor. So Ben, welcome to the All About You podcast. Thank you so much. It's nice to be here. Well, looking forward to our conversation. (laughs) So Ben, you are an actor. So my first question, when you were a child, was it something about the theatre or TV that caught your imagination? I first started getting into acting when I was about 11, 12 years old. Uh, There was a school production on and they needed uh, quite a big chorus. So I decided to get involved in that and um, they actually took it to one of the local theatres. So that was my first experience of being like under the spotlight, on the stage, big audience. And it really just like spiked my attention, my imagination a little bit. And then from there, that was year six. So then I went on to high school and in England for the first three years of high school, everyone has to have theatre classes. So that's when I started just learning a little bit more about theatre and how it works. And again, I was just getting a little bit more excited. I thought, oh, this is something I, I, I really enjoy doing. So everybody had theatre classes. Yeah. Oh my God. I don't know if that's been... still the case now, but when I was at school. Well, I remember in my, my secondary school, we did have drama, but I don't remember anything like theatre. I mean, I think we used to have to sort of, drama teacher gave us a word and you had to act a little thing out <laughs> that. But no, that definitely was not as grand as theatre classes were. Wow. Yeah, I don't know if it was particularly in my school, but yeah, we used to do dance and, and obviously acting as well, singing, all the different sort of genres. So I think... We were especially lucky, and I think it's just a great way not only to learn about theatre, but to to give you confidence in life as well. And I think it's a really good subject that all uh, students should be able to to study at school. I think that's a really good point you've made there, giving people confidence. Yes. Because I think when you read about actors, they always say, actually, in real life, I'm quite a shy person, I'm a private person. But when I'm playing a character and I'm in costume, in makeup, and I may have a wig, I can go out there and be so extrovert because it's not me. So I think this showing a different side of your personality because you're somebody else, as in you're acting another character, I can really see how that can help with confidence. Mm, it's, yeah. it's so true. I'm one of those people. I'm, I'm actually quite shy, and especially in groups, I, I find it quite hard to, to talk and communicate. And I think for me, theatre is, is my, my release. As you say, you, you're you not necessarily being yourself. You're putting on uh, a disguise, you're putting on your makeup, your costume, and and then just being out there on the stage. Yeah. Well, if you got me doing a speech as me, oof. I because would, then you would have to be you. have to be me, but I, yeah, I find that yeah. really nerve wracking. Oh, <laughs> interesting. So yeah, so so I started high school. I um, as I say, we had the theatre classes, and then came along this amazing opportunity. We had quite a famous uh, local professional theatre, um, and they were putting on a, a Christmas production of the Railway Children. Uh, the Railway Children, if people don't know, has quite a big um, child cast, so they were looking for lots of children to take part. Unfortunately, I'd actually missed the main auditions, but I think, I don't know, if someone had dropped out or something had happened, and there was this one part that was up for grabs. Um, and I think it was my mum that saw the, the audition advertised in the local paper. So I went along uh, and had this audition. My first audition, so I can remember being really, really nervous, but the director was just you know really calm, made me feel very comfortable. And all we did was sat at a desk and he just asked me to read the script. Um, and he was reading the other parts and I remember just finishing and he just looked at me and was like that was amazing even though you're just sat there you were just putting so much emotion into it and 
even like moving around in your chair. And how old were you at this audition? I would have been uh, 11 or 12. Right, so quite young. So I was quite young, yeah. And then, yeah, I remember getting home and an hour later getting a phone call saying they'd, they got the part. Wow, so it was a done deal then. So, you read the script, the director saw what he liked, the mannerisms, yeah. you put your heart into it and you got it. Got oh part, my God. Which was uh, amazing. So then obviously starts the process of rehearsals, the run up to the, to the run. And I think the run of the show was maybe just over a month which obviously being a kid was fantastic because I didn't have to go to school every day. <laughs> oh my God. Um, and, and again, that's having to go to work to the theatre every day, which is like, wow, this is incredible. This is what I want to do with my life. And I just felt so privileged from the age of, of 12, knowing that's what I wanted to do with my life, to be an actor. You know, you get people in their 20s and 30s that still don't know what to do. Like, oh, what do I want to work as? So to know us from such a young age was just... I, I probably say this in every podcast, but I'm a great believer in the stars will align. Mm -hmm. And for you, for that to happen, as you say, your mum saw the advert, you went along, you were very nervous but you just blossomed in front of the director. He, he saw what he wanted. Mm -hmm. And within an hour, you had the phone call to say you'd got the part. So yeah. the stars definitely aligned for you. I agree with that because actually there was quite a lot of people from my school that went to the initial auditions. My, my drama teacher was amazing, but she had her favorites who she would push forward. And she told all these people about the audition, but she didn't tell me. So I think like you say, the stars aligned to to get me in that production. Yeah, definitely. And it was, um, at the time I found, I found that really difficult because it, it happened on various occasions with, with school productions, um, other auditions, she would always tell people, but she would never tell me. But I think that looking back made me a stronger person because it made me have to fight for what I wanted. And again, I, another situation was um, auditions for the National Youth Theatre, which is a, a course in London for, for teenagers, usually about 16, 17 when you, when you go. And it's during the summer. And I heard her talking to her favorites in the, in the costume department about it. And so I went in and then afterwards I asked a few people and they explained. So I kind of, I, luckily, I, luckily I'd heard and I could get myself in there and get myself an audition to go as well. And in the end, I was the only one that got in, so. So we're not going to mention any <laughs> names as to who this person was, but just look what happened. Yeah. Look what happened. But as I say, it made me made me a stronger person and made me fight for what for what I wanted. So yeah. even though, as I say, it was difficult back then, I appreciate it now. Wow. Because you've got to have thick skin if you want to be a performer. Yeah, I, th I think that's as you say, whether it's singing, whether it's dancing. Because you're going to get an awful lot of no's yes. before that. Yes, absolutely. You can't take it personally. Yeah. And I think we had a conversation before saying sometimes it's not you. It's just that you're too tall. You're too short. They are looking for a particular sort of type of person. Exactly. And if you may be the most talented person there, but you're too tall, for example. Yeah. Yeah. Usually when you go to these auditions, they can be hundreds of people going for one part and as you say it's just it's finding the right cast that fit together so quite often or not it's your physicality that will give you the no not yeah. your performance so yeah you've got to be prepared for rejections and rejections and rejections but when you get that yes it is the most incredible feeling and you get that phone call and you you go to the rehearsals and you get on that stage like the such smell a smell of the grease paint, roll <laughs> the crowd as they say. <laughs> and um, I, but since then I've actually been on the other side and, I, and I've been on the panel to, um, at auditions. When you're on that panel you want everyone to succeed, you don't want anyone to slip, slip up or when they're singing sing a wrong note, you're, you're really rooting for these people so it's interesting now to, to be on that side and, and feel what that person is feeling for you and I guess as well you're you are absolutely so talented but you've got the wrong look for the character we need for this production yeah. so yeah as you say being on the other side has given you a huge insight it's taken you back through your journey of sort of moving up the ranks as an actor it has yeah right so where do we go next then 
So obviously the next step for a lot of people would be trying to go to drama school, do some sort of course like that. But again, it's, it's so difficult and there's just so much competition. So when I was 17, I, I started applying for drama schools and universities. And you, you, you go to these auditions, which you have to pay for, which is I, I, something I find really, really shocking. You know, you might apply for 10 different places. And for each audition, it might be 50 or 60, 60 pounds to go to. Plus your travel expenses, if you have to stay away. So it's, it's quite expensive. So you have to be quite selective as well. Now, I remember when you told me the first time you have to pay to go auditions, I was totally shocked. I can understand having to pay for your travel expenses, but there again, you know, if you're living in the north or the south of England, having to get to London or Manchester or whatever. But the purpose of paying for an audition, is that because they have to hire rehearsal studios or a theatre or something? Maybe in some cases, but I think for the majority of the auditions that I went to, they were at the, the schools. If you're a lucky person, you would get into drama school and you would have your, your three-year course and learn all the different um, genres. Unfortunately, I didn't get in uh, my first year auditioning, but I was lucky enough maybe about five months after, to, to actually get my first job for a, a touring theatre company based in Scotland. And I remember it really well because I, I was actually doing my sort of second year of auditioning trying to get into drama school. Um, I was up in Edinburgh, I just had like a day of auditioning and I was just going home on the train and I, I got a phone call saying, oh, we'd like to hire you for this job, we really enjoyed your audition. And I was just like, oh my gosh, this is, this is fantastic. Because since doing the Railway Children, I hadn't had any more professional work. This was something else, to, to be going on tour for six months uh, around the whole of the UK. Yeah, it was, it was so exciting to think about. And then I had to stop thinking about, oh, well, I've now got a job. Do I want to carry on trying to get into a drama school or a university? Or do I go down the work path? That year I did get some placements on some courses. But I thought, you know what? I'm working, I'm getting paid, I'm having an amazing experience. Why do I want to go and pay thousands and thousands of pounds to go and study when really I can be learning on a job? I mean, I guess with acting, like other jobs, okay, what are your qualifications? Well, I've got a degree in this, I've got a master's in that. Being an actor, you have a CV of roles and parts and things you've done, but do you have to have a certificate to say you've done three years at this drama school do you have to have that in general or are they quite happy with like your work I think there's so many different ways to look at it obviously I think it's beneficial to study because you are learning so many skills um, and those skills um, can be shown off in auditions for example to get you those jobs or if you go to one of the top drama schools just having that name on your CV will open so many doors but as I say, there's so, many, so much competition that not everyone gets that opportunity. So many people do just learn on the job. Yeah. By to. I mean, for you, though, getting that phone call and thinking, right, I've got six months of work touring. I mean, that feeling must have been, I don't know, on the train, did you crack open a miniature of gin and tonic? <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> I just remember just beaming just having this huge smile on my face all the way all the way home wow. and I'm obviously wanting to tell people but I, I I waited until I got home so I could see for example my parents reaction so yeah it was yeah it was I amazing. mean that's not bad it's the first gig is it really no no amazing I can't remember what the statistic is but a professional actor I think only works on average three or four weeks a year on average so, so to have six months was pretty... Yeah, I mean, that, that is crazy, isn't it? It's, it's hard to believe. The, yeah, the security of an, of an actor is, is not great. So you've always got to have your finger in lots of other pies, be it like working in hospitality or, or tourism, something that you can always fall back on, but something that gives you that freedom that if you do get a job or an audition, you can just go off and do it. And I guess nobody actually goes into the arts to make money yes we can talk about top actors top singers top dancers that type of thing but that's probably an extremely small percentage so as you say 
people working in restaurants, hospitality, are singers, dancers, yeah. actors, makeup artists, etc., etc. Because you're you're not in it for the money unless you get into that one percent. So you've got to be incredibly dedicated to to pursue what you want to do as well as literally earning the money to pay your bills on a daily basis. You do. It's so tricky as well because talking about England, the place to be or the place that was to be was in London. So a lot of people used to move to London because that's where you used to get a lot of your auditions. Obviously living in London, is so expensive. And, and people just generally just end up having to just work so much and then you become so focused on that work to earn the money to pay your bills that sometimes the auditions fall by the wayside mm. and you, you don't go to as many as you as you should. Now I think it's a bit more varied, you know, you've got like different hubs like Manchester, Birmingham where there's a lot more going on there as well, a lot more auditions and stuff, so it has changed with the times. Glad to it's hear it. <laughs> so yeah, so so I went on tour um, and I actually worked for quite a few years with that, with that company, which is amazing, doing lots of different classical uh, pieces, pantomime, and it's something that I, I really enjoyed and it's actually probably the type of work that I've done most in my career is touring theatre. I, I just love being on the road, going to different places every day to perform, having to really think about the spaces where you are, because obviously different theatres, different spaces are different sizes, different lights. So you've just really got to be switched on all the time, which is something I love. So with a touring company, how does that work? Do you hire a coach and you take the costumes and the props and every, you all pile into a, a coach type thing and you're like the travelling circus. Is that how it works? It is a bit like a travelling circus, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, usually you get given a couple of vehicles, maybe like a big, big van and a small van depending on how big the cast is and off you go. And where are you staying? I mean, are you just in travel lodges or...? It, it depends. For example, I'm still touring now um, in Spain and we all live at home. And um, Perhaps we'll go away for a week and stop in a hotel. But usually we'll, we'll go and come back to our own ho our houses. Right. Um, in the UK, I've, yeah, I've stopped in travel lodges for months at a time, which in itself is really difficult because, you know, you're sharing a room with someone all the time. You haven't got cooking facilities, so you're not eating properly. And of course, that's really important because when you're any performer, nutrition, sleep, exercise, looking after your voice, looking after your skin, all that type of stuff is just so important to keep you up and running. It is. Yeah. I mean, I was just thinking, if I, you know, if I find myself in a travel lodge and there's a bunch of actors staying there, <laughs> what a night out that would be. I mean, you just wouldn't stop laughing, would you? Oh, I don't know. We were always too exhausted. Too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the reality is, oh, God, no, you know, we'd all be in bed by nine o'clock because we're shattered. I think if we were just performing in, in like, one theatre for a whole week, that would be different. But <laughs> the jobs I do, every day you're in a different place. So, you know, you would arrive maybe midday, you'd set up your set, sound check. Um, quite often the venues would have to pr provide food for you to make sure you were getting at least one decent meal. And then you do your performance, which may start at seven, half seven in the evening. You'll finish maybe 10 o'clock, then you've got to take your set down, pack your van, and then usually drive for a couple of hours as well. Oh. To get you to the next location, and then yeah, so it's it's not all glitter and sparkle, not is at it? All. <laughs> Unless you make it and you're in the West End or Broadway, it's well, it's exactly. a hot slog. But yeah. again, I, I love that hot slog because you're getting to see so many places and you, and meeting so many people as well. And the experience of doing that is absolutely priceless. Yeah, yeah, it really is. In you know, I've uh, it's typical in the UK to do outdoor productions, for example. So I've done a tour of that as well, which was an experience because you have to perform in all weathers. You know, it's been storm, rain, you're absolutely drenched. You know, you're trying to project your voice. People and your are, makeup sliding off yeah, your face. Yeah, people are fighting in the audience because they've got <laughs> their umbrellas up and no one can see. It's, yeah. But then you get absolutely glorious days as well where everyone's just so happy with their little picnics, their bottles of wine. Um, and and we, we get to perform in some incredible places, like some gorgeous parks or in front of castles, stately homes. 
you, you just get to see so much. I was going to say, you've got so many extremes there, from the makeup sliding off your face and people fighting because the umbrella situation, and then the next thing, you're in front of a beautiful castle, it's floodlit, people are there in their ball gowns and their candelabras. <laughs> You've got to be adaptable, I think. As you an have to performer. be so adaptable. It's something I think about quite a lot because when you think of a performer, or maybe you ask an actor, everyone's like, oh, yeah, you've got to really be in the moment, you've got to be this character, you've got to really feel it. But especially with, with touring theatre, quite often you have to, I have to split my mind because there's things going on and you, you have to think of the space. So you can't always be fully in that character fully in the moment but i've been in theaters and the set's falling down mid show and it's like and you're there and you're trying to perform and act like nothing's going on and think but at the same time you're thinking okay i'm going to carry on acting but I, what am i going to do to you know solve this situation and and i just remember um it's just me and this other girl on stage and just remember grabbing her and walking down into the audience carrying on the performance so they could close the curtains and the stage crew could fix oh, whatever they need to fix. Very clever, thinking on your feet. Yeah, well, we were just having this romantic stroll around, around the auditorium. <laughs> <for it. laughs> uh, and the situation was, again, with the outdoor theatre, uh, it was Wind in the Willows, and I was playing the, the evil uh, weasel character. And it was just me and my sidekick on the stage, and it was mid-song, uh, and there was, uh, there'd been this woman, and she was shouting out, obscenities throughout the whole show bearing in mind it's a children's well, family performance and a lot of them were directed at me and anyway she decided to get up during my song come onto stage and start twerking up against me <laughs> and again you're like well the show must go on so i have to split my brain and i have to then carry on performing this song but also Trying to get someone's attention to come and like. I was going to say, help. did no theatre personnel uh, see what was going on? Wow, well, there were a lot of people there, and it was actually in the city where the company was based, and everyone from the office was there, and my bosses, but no one came to the rescue. And I was just like, oh, what? I mean, what's this woman going to do next? What? I mean, I, I don't know what to do. So I literally just grabbed hold of her in a, like a hug and just carried on singing my song and kind of directed it a little bit towards her. The song finished and then people came and removed her from the premises. I mean, you've just reminded me, <laughs> I've been to a, a very high-end classical concert, an extremely high-end theatre, and everybody was dressed in, in their ball gowns in the orchestra and, and the conductor was dressed in his tails. And there were two security guards at either side of the stage. And I'm thinking, are they expecting trouble from this crowd <laughs> tonight? And everybody was very well dressed. We paid an absolute fortune for our tickets. So in that high-end production, we had two security guards. And, and the possibility of something going wrong was probably incredibly slim. Something which is outdoors, family, all different things. And something like that happens and just everybody, maybe they were all just frozen in terror and didn't know what to do. I think they were probably just embarrassed for me. And you just, <laughs> you just styled it out though. You styled, styled it out. out. Well and done. And I got a, a fabulous applause for it. Wow. <laughs> and I bet she's telling that story to somebody. I think she was very, very drunk. Apparently when she got thrown out, she threw herself on the floor and cried. So if she was that drunk, she may not even remember. No, probably not. Probably <laughs> not. But I bet a few people in the audience have relayed that story. I'm sure, <laughs> yeah. Oh, that, poor, that poor actor. <laughs> <laughs> and especially sort of in a children's production as well. I mean, you just never know when these things are going to go horribly wrong, do you? No. <laughs> <laughs> But I think, uh, I mean, it's wonderful that uh, theatre now is so accessible, but I do think you get a certain type of people that, that don't know the etiquette when they go to the theatre. And I think I, I hear more and more stories. Um, and I think sometimes, you know, people are used to going to maybe pantos where you do shout out and then you go to a, maybe a straight play and they're shouting things out. It's like, no, that's not what you do in a straight play. Or, or getting mobiles out, taking taking photos and pictures, and or even speaking on their phone. I I've heard so many stories of of top actors stopping their performances, and having a go at audience members for getting their phones out and texting or yeah. 
I certainly relate to what you're saying here because I really love the opera. Mm -hmm. And when I go to the opera, you generally pay a fair amount of money for the ticket and I like to dress nicely. To me, you know, it's a big event. The lights go down and your anticipation that, you know, the orchestra starts. And then during the performance, all of a sudden you see these glows where people are checking their emails, scrolling Facebook. And I think, hang on a minute, you know, we're in a dark auditorium and especially if somebody's incredibly close to you, like next to you, all mm -hmm. of a sudden you've got this glowy foam, which in a dark auditorium is like having a Belisha beacon. <laughs> and it's like, no, you know, unless you are a brain surgeon and you are doing brain surgery and you're, you're assisting somebody the other side of the world and you're having to do it by what's up. No, please. There, yeah. there can be nothing happening that you need to have your phone glowing in the dark. So for me in the audience, it's, it's horrendous. It's bad etiquette and that person needs to be thrown out. Yeah. But as a performer, I, I just can't imagine what it must be like. Yeah, so, so disrespectful. So disrespectful. And yeah, anything like that, people people just chatting and, and I don't understand, like you're paying to come and watch this performance and and you're there and you're not even paying attention. It's like, what? why why have you come? I mean, for me, I would never pay money for a big concert now because when you look at these big concerts, all you see is all these arms up, everybody's video. I mean, I know there was a big thing on social media, Beyonce, had somebody right in front of the stage doing that and she said, right, stop, stop to her musicians. She said, I will not continue until you put that phone away. You are here to enjoy the concert in the moment. Mm -hmm. You've got me singing live, you've got my band live, you've got my dancers, you've got the light, you've got the spectacular. Enjoy it in the moment. Yeah. You know, you can buy the DVD later if that's what you want. But why do people do that? I mean, Let's live in the moment. You know, with the arts, it's live. Live in the moment, please, from an audience point of view. And I'm sure you would say from a performer. Definitely, definitely. But it's just society today with, with social media. It's all got to be captured. And, and we're just living it through the phone, like, un, unlike living it live. It's like, it's just there in front of you. Why do you want to see it on the screen? It makes no sense to me. Yeah. But that's also something... Um, that I actually find quite difficult is, is social media because obviously as a performer you're performing on stage but then you've got to have a big social media presence as well whether that's as an individual or as a company so quite often you know I'll be on tour now you'll finish your show but then we have to spend time making social media videos and I, I, I find it really tedious just you know trying to get that perfect video or I'm like, no, I like performing on the stage. I want to be there live, not filmed. <laughs> That's interesting. I've never actually thought of that before because back in the day, you had the poster for the production mm -hmm. and then you would have the, you know, the stills of the actors or the, the singers or the performers. And that was really it. Apart from the performer, and yes, you'd have the blurb in, in the programme, but that was it. Mm -hmm. But now, as you say, social media plays such a huge part in it I, again for an individual you're promoting yourself as an actor because you never know what producer what um, director might see some of your clips or your photos but also as a company you, you as a company you want to market your production and get um, as many people coming to watch it as possible so for a company it's super important to have lots of videos lots of photos out there and obviously there's so many different applications now you're doing different things for different applications whether it be facebook TikTok, dances you know there's so much going on and i think another thing that's changed over the years back in the day you would go to the theater you would go to the concert venue and you would buy your ticket or you would phone up and buy a ticket mm -hmm. now everything is done through a booking agency mm -hmm. You know, there's often a fee to pay. Have you got a genuine ticket? It, it's all getting very complex, isn't it, now? You know, as you say, social media for the performers and, and for the production company, the tour company. 
and and also how do you access the tickets and all the rest of it so yeah i mean it's it's changed a lot over the years it has a lot a lot and i'm sure it'll carry on changing all the time especially with with covid for example a lot of productions move to online i know the company i work for we do we've got a big online presence now and we we film all our productions that we do so if people are uncomfortable coming to the theatre, they can actually buy it and watch it online. So you're still getting a, a, a theatrical experience, but from the comfort of your own home. I mean, one of the things I got into during the pandemic is Andrew Lloyd Webber was doing a Friday night show. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the ones I watched was Phantom and the Opera from the Royal Opera House. Oh my God. Incredible. Incredible. It, it was just one of the best things I have ever seen. I've got the, the original DVD, which I love anyway, mm -hmm. but that production at the Royal Opera House was just something else, and it's probably one of the best things I have ever seen. And I think so many theatres, ballet companies, operas were producing all this stuff for us at home, and even now I'm getting a, a, a newsletter, I think it's called Backtrack, and it's stuff from all around the world and you just some of the stuff you pay for some of it is free but the amount of opera ballet theatre I watched during the pandemic I have to say it was one of my highlights of the pandemic because probably I wouldn't have had access to all this stuff wouldn't have known it's available and you know I made time right I'm going to sit down today and I'm going to watch this ballet company at three o'clock today who are doing a production of something in Geneva mm -hmm. fantastic it's great. I, I, I do hope, though, that companies are very careful what they continue to make accessible online because, obviously, we want people to go to the theatre because if people don't go to the theatre, then we don't have a job. And if it's really easy to watch things online and, oh, I'm just going to watch it from the comfort of my own home, then it becomes very, very dangerous for the arts. So please carry on going to the theatre. We need support. I love the arts, whether it's music, whether it's ballet, whether it's live theatre. There is nothing like the anticipation, I've got my ticket, you've got your date in the diary, you've got yourself organised, you go to the theatre, you find your seat and everything, and there's that little bit of anticipation, then the orchestra come along and they start warming up, and then the lights go down, it's like, oh my God, for the next like two hours, you are transported. Mm -hmm and there is nothing like it. I mean, as a kid, my mum was the secretary of a theatre manager, so for my six-week school holidays, they were spent in the theatre. I was painting scenery, I was washing plastic flowers, I was helping with costumes, I was in the audience and they were doing rehearsals, particularly pantomime. It was just such a high point of my childhood being in that environment. For my mum it was great, she would take me to work with her. I couldn't go anywhere, I was in the theatre, everybody knew who I was. And when you get backstage in a theatre and you see all what goes on, it's just magical and I think whether it's ballet, opera, the theatre, singing, circus, whatever, it's an incredible world. It's a it's world another of, world. It's a world of imagination. It's colour. It's music. It's lights. It's yeah. I I want to get back into seeing live performances. Absolutely. It's it is interesting from a um, uh, an audience perspective. You know, you're, you're watching it from the front and you're seeing this amazing production. But sometimes I think, wow, wouldn't it be amazing to have the audience backstage, and so they could see what exactly is going on. Um, especially for touring theatre because quite often um, you play numerous roles so you, you run backstage and you're flinging your costume off and you're getting another costume on and maybe changing your makeup and you're like preparing props or having to spin a set so it is a whole other world back there. Can I just ask you one question and I've always wondered about this how do you learn lines? I feel quite lucky I'm really good at having my script and I will read, for example, a page a couple of times and then it will just, just go in my head. So I'll just read it, read it, read it. Okay, it's in my head, then go on to the next page, next page. I'm really, yeah, I'm really lucky that I can learn lines quickly. So is that a skill you've developed? 
I mean, let's imagine we're going to put a, a show on. We've got the paperback book, we've read the book, we're all familiar with the story. You're playing this part, I'm learning this part. We learn our parts individually, but then we have to come together. I'm waiting for you today to say something, then I can say my bit. But then I've got to remember, when I say this word, I've got to pick up a glass of water. Mm -hmm. And when you say something else, you've got to throw your hat away. Yeah. And it's how do you know where where have i got to be when i say those words then i'm picking up the glass of water as i'm taking a drink you're throwing the hat i've then got to drop the glass of water and it's what you're going to say where you're going to say it how you're going to say it what prop you've got in your hand or what prop you're aiming i mean how does all that come together usually you will um, receive your script a couple of weeks before rehearsals and that's your time to really familiarise yourself with your lines. Um, some directors are very strict and they, they want you to have your, your script learnt for the first day of rehearsals. Others are more lax and, and don't mind if you arrive and you don't really know it. Um, and it's also your time to really think about your character and, and understand who your character is. Maybe um, have a voice, uh, decide how they're going to move. So you've got all these things in the back of your mind before you even begin rehearsals. Then you'll arrive at your rehearsals, you usually do a read through with the cast and then you just start getting it up onto its feet. There are some people that um, prefer to learn their lines in rehearsals because they find it easier to think, OK, so I've got to move down to the front of the stage as I'm saying this line. I've got to pick up my cup as I'm saying this line and they associate the movements with their lines. But I just think everyone's a little, a little bit different. And again, different directors will do it differently. Some directors prefer to go through a, a, a whole load of scenes straight through. Some will prefer to do one scene at a time and get it nicely polished, then move on to the next. So it really depends who you're working with. So one question though, Ben, when you read a book and you enjoy the story, you'll read that book quite quickly and you'll get into the story. If you're reading a book and think, oh, you know, I've got to read this book for school or work, not really my thing, and it becomes a bit of a problem, you probably don't like every single production you're in. Mm -hmm. So is it easier with the ones that, oh, yeah, I really want to be this character and I like the role, etc. Does it make it easier if you're happy with that role as suppose oh i've got to go and play a roman soldier and that's really not me <laughs> and i hate i hate the outfit so to speak and oh uh, is it harder to learn the lines of, of a role you're not particularly interested in doing um i guess so I, I mean first of all as an actor i would only apply for a job that i was interested in i play that i think oh, that, oh that's amazing i want to play that character it is true that maybe you, you go to an audition knowing what the, the production is going to be, but you don't know what role you're actually going to be cast as. So yeah, I, I guess some, some roles are more, more difficult than others. Um, I know I had a really hard time playing Sherlock Holmes um, back in the UK. I remember getting the phone call from the director um, to, to offer me the job and he was super excited. He was like, he was like, you don't realise like, we've had hundreds and hundreds of people apply this year um, to be in the production. All the guys wanted to be Sherlock Holmes, but he was like, you are my Sherlock Holmes. I could only see you doing it. Um, and we talked a little bit about what he was thinking, about how I thought the character would be. Then I went off to rehearsals, very, very excited. But sadly, um, his dad was quite ill at the time. So the, the assistant director stepped up um, to, to do the rehearsals and he had a completely different vision to the director and to my vision and he wanted the, the show to be very very straight to have no emotion whereas myself and the actual director I had an idea we wanted him to be a bit more quirky like Doctor Who a bit more of a personality and I had that in my mind um, and I found it very very difficult because you kind of have to do what the director wants and yeah and he made me quite often go in early to have extra rehearsals because I just wasn't doing it how he wanted it to do. So yeah, it, it, it can be quite tricky to, to, to... I have to say, I can see you with Sherlock Holmes, <laughs> definitely. Um, so yeah, it, it, can, it can be difficult depending on the character. And obviously like Sherlock Holmes is, is legendary. 
So you want to do it justice as well. So what, Ben, would be your ideal role? If you could be offered your plum role, what would it be? <laughs> it's a bit of a funny one. I've always loved uh, the musical Joseph and his amazing right, technical yeah. dream coat. And I've always wanted to play Joseph. So what is it about Joseph? I just, uh, I, I, I love the music. I kind of like love the, I guess, the, the journey that he goes on. It's kind of a bit of a roller coaster ride. Unfortunately, I can't sing. So I have a difficult one to, to get. <laughs> I, I think the thing is with, with actors, we can look at a lot of famous actors and, for example, if I think of... Oh, God, who was in Love Actually who played the Prime Minister? Hugh, Hugh. Hugh Grant. OK, let's look at Hugh Grant. Love Actually, Bridget Jones, he's the lovable rogue. Mm-hmm. And I love those type of films, you know, the comedy rom-com. At the end, of, you know, they always get their girls sort of thing. When you get an actor or an actress, because I think now everybody is called an actor, aren't they? They are. have to be politically correct yeah. now. Yeah, so everybody's an actor. <laughs> and people say, you know, you don't want to get typecast. You don't always want to be known as the lovesick person or you don't want to always be known as the the crying female lead that type of thing do people get typecast is it something they worry about or is that just something created by the media oh it's a film with so and so she's always going to play this role i think within film and probably television you do get typecast but obviously in theater there's so many different roles that you you could play in in, in theater that you have a lot more opportunities I think if we think of like James Bond, I mean, I don't know how many James Bonds there have been, we all tend to have our favourite. And I think in the British TV programme Doctor Who, mm -hmm. we all have our favourite, whether that is the Doctor Who was playing that character when we watched it as a kid, or whether you've grown up, and because Doctor Who's gone on for many, many years. Yeah. But it's quite interesting, isn't it? You sort of get to know certain characters, I have to say, and I always say this, I think the UK has the best actors in the world because if we look at a lot of our famous actors, they are classically trained. They've trod the boards, local theatres, and they've worked their way up. Mm -hmm. I tend to think in America, if you are handsome, if you are beautiful, you're an actor whether you can act, sing, dance, whatever. In the UK, I think we just wipe the floor with anybody else in respect mm -hmm. of the classical actor, actress. Do you agree with I, that? I, I do, yeah, I do actually. I mean, a, a prime example is, is Cameron Diaz. You know, very pretty woman, and I think her first film was The Mask. She got that part because of her looks. And she actually had to have acting classes while they were filming it because her acting wasn't up to scratch. So uh, I think that's a prime example. Yeah, I mean, for me, someone like Judy Dench, who I believe I think is in her 80s now, she's played queens, she's played mothers, she was M in James Bond. When I'm looking for a film to watch, I will just put in Judy Dench, see what she's done. All right, yeah, I fancy that film. Because you know it's going to be good. Mm -hmm. Anthony Hopkins, Emma Thompson, Colin Firth. Um, you know, we've got so many and you just think whatever they're in is going to be brilliant. Yeah. And like you say, uh, signal for this is, is the way they can move from theatre to television to film. They can do all the genres, which I think is shows their skill yeah and and i think if we look at dude judy dench i mean i think she's an incredible lady she's even said you know i'm not beautiful but i've got character mm -hmm. and she can be a stern queen she can be a motherly character she can be the person you would want as your best friend because she's she's just so adaptable and to me that is going to take you a lot further than having a pretty face that is going to change over time mm -hmm. and that's what you're known as being the pretty girl that that's got a pretty short run 
Whereas somebody like Judy Dench, and, and I think she is beautiful facially as, as a character and what I've read, I think she, I would love to meet Judy Dench. But she's not what you call classically beautiful. No. But look at her career. Yeah. And she's still going strong. And when you read articles, no, why why do I want to retire? I'm I'm happy doing what I'm doing and as soon you know, as long as the roles keep coming, which they will. Mm -hmm. So I think the UK, we are incredibly blessed with our oh, actors and actresses, actors. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Definitely. Oh, it would be a dream to work with some of those legends. Well, you never know, Ben. <laughs> I mean, as we said at the start of the podcast, when the stars align. So anything you'd like to add before we finish the podcast? If anyone uh, is interested in acting, I would just say go for it it is the most incredible job or even a hobby and um, that you can do and I, and I feel lucky because even though it is my job I don't say it is a job because I'm doing something I love there's so many opportunities out there and you just have to work for it push for it and just be strong and you will, will get rid lots and lots of rejections but that's all part of of building your character and it doesn't matter how old you are as well. I think that's the most wonderful thing, you know. There may be people out there that think, oh, when I was young, I wanted to be an actor. And if you have that passion still, and you still think that, and then I would say, go for it, because you can be an actor at any age. And in fact, I think the older you get, um, the easier it is to actually get into the industry. Because a lot of people start when they're young, and because it is so difficult, they kind of wean off and, and stop going for auditions. So I think the older you get, the more opportunities that you'll have because there's not as much competition as well, which is, which is interesting. But it's a wonderful life. Ben, it's been a brilliant conversation. Thank you. It's been absolutely fantastic. And thank you for sort of lifting the lid on what goes on behind the grease paint and the spotlights and everything. And thank you for being a guest on the All About You podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I hope you have enjoyed the conversation. Don't forget, if you have a story you would like to tell, please get in touch. My email address is allaboutyoupodcast at yahoo.com and thank you for listening.